So I want to talk about an idea that we can call it, um, we'll talk about an idea we'll call the loving gaze. Um, this is something that can be used in your meditation practice, but it's also something one can apply in one's life. Um, it's much easier to apply it in one's life once one has practiced it. And it's just a reminder that we do meditation, not to get good at meditation, but to, to get good at life, you know, to, to sort of uh, practice how we would like to live, right? practice how we would like to um, engage with our day. Um, So there's an idea, we can talk about love, you'll hear about love a lot in spirituality or in, you know, in self-help and, and um, I talk about it a lot here as well. And, and I want to just narrow it down to this idea of the loving gaze, which is a way of interacting with our experience. So gaze is sort of metaphorical almost because we could be sitting here and feeling our breath with a loving gaze. That means with an attitude of love towards the object of our attention. So in meditation, that would be the object that we are concentrating on. So it could be our breath or it could be our mind or it could be our feelings or it could be our body or it could be a candle. We could approach it with a loving gaze. This could manifest as a way we actually look you know there's an actual kind of loving expression on our face and a loving um look in our eyes and that can be helpful to sort of put on that expression um but it, it is not that's not the point right one could also think that it's about feeling a really warm and gushy feeling of love. And again, that can be helpful and that can be a consequence of doing the practice. But that's also not exactly what I mean by the loving gaze. So just keep those in mind because those are ways to get there. If you're sitting here and you're going, you know, I need to bring some love into my practice or my life. What would it look like on my face if I felt love right now, right? What would it feel like in my body if I felt love right now? Um, that is a way in, but it's not, the, it's not the meaning of a loving gaze. do a little bit of philosophy here there's there's um in, in in the world of ethics and aesthetics and stuff we could talk about two types of value one type of value is something that's of instrumental value and the other is something that's of intrinsic value so something that's of purely instrumental value is um an object or situation or person that you that you see as valuable only because they're going to get you something else down the road. They're going to get you very instrumental to you being able to get something you really want, you know, in the future. Most of the things we interact with our in our lives, we interact with them as if they are of purely instrumental value. So the perfect the prototypical example of instrumental value is money, right? You get some money, but the money itself isn't that exciting, right? It's only exciting because it gets you other stuff, right? That's the prototypical example, but for most things, that's how we interact with it. How often are you actually tasting the intrinsic value of your food as opposed to just um, using it to, to sate your hunger, right? How often are you, you know, when you're driving your car, when you're washing the dishes, when you're everything you're doing there is because you see it as having an instrumental value. Often when you're just putting on your clothes, so you look nice, maybe you, maybe you love to look nice. That would be evaluating the intrinsic value of it. But most of us put it on so that other people will like us or so that we don't get embarrassed or it's of instrumental value. 
When we walk through the world, most of the time we're saying, how can these objects be instrumental to me getting what I want or to me not getting what I don't want? Let's just say that's not really a loving gaze. I'm not saying it's an evil thing to do, but it's not a loving gaze one has. If you, for instance, and you can tell this, if you think of your romantic partner as just in just useful to you to get something else down the road, then you wouldn't think of that as a real loving relationship. Now, we do use our partners and our friends and our family for instrumental reasons all the time. Um, but that doesn't mean we couldn't also love them intrinsically. But probably most of our interactions with our external environment, even with our internal environment, is an, is an instrumental transactional kind of relationship. What in this environment can get me something that I need, can help me get where I want? Now that begs the, the best, that um, really would lead one to inquire what is the intrinsic thing we're actually aiming for in the end, right? And that's a whole you know field of philosophy, and you know one answer might be happiness or something like that, but we're not going to go there really because I want to talk about what it is to interact with something as if it has intrinsic value. So if something has intrinsic value, that means just the having of it now, just maybe the experiencing of it now, is valuable in and of itself. That doesn't require you to get anything else down the road. How many things in your life do you interact with in that way? as if they are valuable in and of themselves that let's just put it this way for now just the experiencing of them now is sufficient value to justify you experiencing them how many things in your life do you interact with in that way it's conceivable it's zero honestly don't beat yourself up our habit of mind is to think instrumentally and even when we get happiness or pleasure, for most of us, there's a moment of enjoying it as intrinsic. But pretty soon after that, we are engaged in a kind of transactional negotiation. How long can I keep it? How long can I have this pleasure? How do I get it again? How do I make sure it doesn't go away? Is it good enough? This is the nature of mind. <clears throat> the nature of mind is built inside of time, inside of cause and effect. Mind is how do I initiate a series of causes and effects that lead to what I want? In this moment, and then this moment, and then this moment. It's a powerful, amazing, beautiful tool. So for those just showing up, we're, we're talking about the difference between engaging with our life as if things are of instrumental value, which means they're just useful to us to get something else, and engaging with our life as if things are with, of intrinsic value. And we're just about to talk about what it's like to engage with something as if it's in, of intrinsic value. And this is where the idea of a loving gaze comes in. When you look at an object with a loving gaze, when that is not just the expression on your face, the, the whole attitude you have towards the object, 
then you are looking at it as if it's valuable in and of itself. As if it doesn't need to justify its being. And again, I just ask you to think about how you would look at someone or something that you do genuinely love. How you would want to look at them, even, even if you don't look at them this way. You could think of a baby or a pet as well. Often we'll do this, generate these images of love to start getting a feeling of what it's like. And the feeling is very important, but the feeling isn't always there. And we can practice the loving gaze without the feeling until the feeling comes. And so I'm asking you, think about what is it like to look on somebody with love and how does it relate to them being enough? That is, they are of intrinsic value. They don't need to give you anything else. They don't need to accomplish something. They don't need to be of use to you to get to somewhere else down the road. They don't need to improve. They don't need to. All those things could be done and be true, but in the moment, they are valuable in and of themselves as they are. This is what a loving gaze consists of, is the acceptance that the thing in front of us is for right now valuable in and of itself, is worthwhile in and of itself. And mindfulness will usually cut this back to just as acceptable is in and of itself, right? To make it as easy as possible. But we're pushing the boundaries a little here because this really can be a way to live. And let's just see how that might be. So I need to go into the kitchen to get a spoon to stir my, my tea. How, what is the normal experience of that? Well, I'm in my head going, I need a spoon. And I walk into the kitchen to get the spoon. Probably I'm already thinking about other things on the way because the spoon's not that important. All it needs to do is stir my tea, right? I pick up the spoon. I probably don't see it really. I see that it's a spoon and that's it, right? I just label it spoon and then I'm on my way. I get back. I still have it in my hand. I probably barely feel it, right? I just know, feel it enough to hold it. You hear what I'm saying? We're barely experiencing the spoon. And, and this is because we think of it as purely instrumental, right? We have reduced the experience of the spoon to a thing that has got the right shape and substance to stir my tea and, and maybe societal like uh, norms to stir my tea. I could probably stir my tea with a stick, but there's just something wrong about that society. <laughs> so there's no, there's not a loving gaze in there, right? It's just a spoon. Why would we have a loving gaze towards a spoon? What would it be like to engage with this whole activity with a loving gaze. Well, the way I'm getting at it today, there's lots of other ways to talk about it and we've talked about it in the past, but today I'm getting at it by suggesting we, we would start to see this whole experience of, his, of intrinsic value. Not something that just has a goal at the end, but in and of itself, the getting of the spoon, the spoon itself, the carrying of the spoon, the holding of the spoon, and the stirring of the tea, all being of intrinsic value. Not just some purpose so that I can drink the tea and have it taste exactly the way I want it. So what would that be like? I'd walk into the kitchen and open the drawer, but now the, I would hear the drawer open. I would see what the drawer is made of. Because, it's, because I'm seeing it as intrinsically valuable. This drawer is of intrinsic value. I would be seeing it with a loving gaze. I would reach in and I would see the spoon. I would see its smoothness. I would see its texture. I would see the, feel the coolness of it. Because it is good enough in and of itself. It's valuable in and of itself. 
as I dipped it into the water, the whole experience of stirring would in in and of itself be a valuable experience. And there, I have a friend who right now, her her spiritual path is is one of the tea ceremonies from, from, I think it's a Japanese tea ceremony. And just a very formal way of drinking your tea. It's all about we would t- say it's all about a kind of mindfulness, but today you might say it's about seeing the intrinsic value in everything you're doing. When you fully are in the loving gaze, you drop out of time because we're now no longer concerned about what this moment will lead to down the road. You can drop out of mind in the fully loving gaze. You drop out of mind and are just in present moment experience. Now, I went from somebody you love deeply to a spoon, right? And there's a whole bunch of things in between. But what we are practicing, whether we know it or not, when we are sitting in meditation is this loving gaze. We're starting to practice saying, this breath in and of itself is enough as it is. You know, something comes to mind here is, it's a kind of, philosophical question that feels like sophistry it doesn't feel like a real question but we always ask it and it's like what's the meaning of life right what's the meaning of life when we think about the meaning of life what we're saying is here's my life what does it lead to that gives it meaning that's really what we mean what is it connected to that gives it meaning And what people will pull out is something like God, or, or if, it's, if you're more of a humanist, some kind of benefit to humanity or beauty or something, right? You'll, you'll move it. You'll say, my life leads to this intrinsically valuable thing. And so you're taking your whole life and saying, my life is instrumental to something else. That's the whole question is, what's the meaning of my, my life? Well, what is my life instrumental to? The very question is a mind question. It's a question that says, my life can't be just valuable on its own because it's because of time, because it's got to be instrumental to, to, to something. And in this way of thinking, when we realize the sun is going to blink out in 5 billion years, some of us will go, well, what's the point of anything then? <laughs> right? It's 5 billion down years down the road, but it's like, well, if everyone's just going to disappear, no one's going to remember no one's going to remember any of us who are alive in a hundred years, maybe in 50 years, right? So what's the point of anything? Well, that's an instrumental way of thinking, right? Saying my life has to have this effect or it has to be related to something else. It's an instrumental way of seeing your whole life. But what if, what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is saying the meaning of your life is your life. And the meaning of your life is this moment. This was the point of it all, right? This was the point of it all. What if this moment is the point of it all? How would you interact with this moment? And just see how the mind wants to get in the way. It's like, well, this can't be the point of it all. It's, you know, uh, well, no, this is the point of it all. The movie all leads to now. This is the climax. And then this moment and then this moment, they're all the climax. And so we come back and you would, would you not look on this moment with a loving gaze if you realized it was the, 
the 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 value the thing of most sacred beauty in the in the universe it's scary because the mind then goes well what do i have to do i don't have anything else to do you're telling me i've already got the most important thing right now what what else is the rest of my life for that's right you can be quiet now for a while mind you don't have to worry so much And so we can practice this. You don't have to buy into the philosophy I'm, I'm spinning here. It's a way of trying to sort of invoke a different perspective on your life. So when we practice meditation, we're practicing a loving gaze. But when we're practicing a loving gaze, we're practicing letting go of time. We're practicing letting go of instrumentality. We're practicing seeing things as beautiful in and of themselves including our pain, including our, our sadness, including our anguish, including our fear, including our mind, including our enemies, whatever those are. When we practice following our breath in with a loving gaze, we are saying this breath is everything. Nothing else is required. It needs serve no other purpose, including my, my spiritual journey, right? It can't be I need to follow this breath so I get where I want spiritually. I mean, it can be. It's okay if it's that. But that's, a, that's, that's not the fully loving gaze. The fully loving gaze is this breath is enough. It need, I, it need give me nothing. It need not teach me anything. It need not make me better. And this pain is enough. And this fear is enough. And this insecurity is enough. And this, this life is enough. None of that means you won't continue using your mind and progressing and making money and friends. And that, that, that flows out of being present naturally. It's not your requirement. You don't need to work on that. At least not, not while you're meditating. So this is a famous example of a, let's see if I can get this up, a famous example of a loving gaze. Let's see, if, there we go. This is Maharshi, the famous photo. You know, he didn't, you, know, you can just put that in your, in your head as a little model of like, again, it, it's silly to pretend to have a loving gaze, but it can be effective as a way to start. What would I feel like inside if I had that look on my face, right? That's a that's a, a man who, who didn't talk for years, I think decades. Because what was the point? Right. And eventually he talked because he had things that helped people that he had that he ended up saying, but he was comfortable just gazing out on the world for a long time. That's not a requirement of having the loving gaze. There's very active people who have, who have a similar kind of approach. But. One more example, because this is, where, this is where I get caught. You know, it's something like, um, it's whatever you find the most annoying in your life. That's the place can you bring your loving gaze. Like, like filling out taxes or something, right? or um, grading papers, 
it can be it can be fun of course but it can also be brutal um you know there's certain household duties picking up the trash or scrubbing up the bath scrubbing the toilet They're good places to look because you can see so clearly how you're experiencing it as just something I've got to do to get on to the next thing. And so you can get a real taste of what that's like. And then, and then you can see, well, can I bring this other approach to this moment? And so again, I'm using this phrase, the loving gaze, but the gaze is not the eyes. The gaze is your, is your whole attitude toward your experience. Your eyes are closed and we feel our breath. Do we gaze on that breath with our feeling, right? with the eyes of our heart, with a loving gaze. Now, there is, there are markers that this is starting to happen and they are markers in the body. The body will start to relax. There can be actual feelings of emotion like warmth and, and loving lovey-dovey kind of emotions but that's actually not required there's sort of a, a a letting go of tension ultimately and in doing that at first the loving gaze will allow for emotions that might be difficult to arise right that we're sort of pushing down so it's not always immediately what we would normally associate with you know love and peace and paradise right but even if you can get just a little taste, you're sitting there, you're, you're, you're doing your breath meditation or you're washing the toilet and you just get a taste of what it would be like and you feel a little bit of that relaxation. I don't have to get this right. I don't have to move past this. I can just be right here. And so we'll practice that today in meditation, but you can practice it in life as well. Just there's lots of times where the stakes are low. You got to stir your tea. You got to wash the dishes. What would it look like if I just took this moment and accepted that it has intrinsic value? And it's not just here to get me to some other moment later on. Because here's the thing, the other moment later on is going to be just like this one. It's going to require you, if you want to get anything out of it, to look at it with love. 